webinar. My name is Janine Freeman and I'm an engineer on the SAM development team here at NREL. The topic of today's webinar will be an introdu introduction to using solar resource data in SAM. This will include the basics of solar radiation, what types of data are available, and how to choose what resource data to use. The webinar will be about 40 minutes with 20 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the recording as well as a copy of the slides will be available on the SAM learning page. <coughs> Before getting into the webinar, I want to remind you that this webinar is part of the 2013-2014 SAM webinar series, which you can see listed here. This schedule can also be found on the SAM learning page, and from there you can register for any of these free one-hour webinars. If you can't make a webinar that you're interested in, don't worry. We also plan to record and post all of the webinars after they're given so that you can listen at your convenience. But we encourage attending them if you're able so that you can ask any questions you might have. With that out of the way, here's an overview of the topics I'm going to cover today. I'm trying to span a pretty broad audience here, so I'll be covering everything from a very basic introduction to more in-depth considerations of using various types of data. So please bear with me if the webinar occasionally gets too basic or advanced for your particular user level. The topics I'll be addressing will include the basics of solar resource, how measured and modeled resource data are produced, which will also touch on planar array irradiance, the importance of leveraging long-term historical data, information about the various types of weather data available in SAM, and finally, how to choose a resource file for your project. <coughs> I'd also like to point out that even though many of my examples are PV related, the information in this webinar is relevant to other solar technologies as well, including CSP and CPV. So first, I'll quickly go through some of the basics of the solar resource for those who are pretty new to modeling solar projects. Understanding these basics is a necessary foundation to understand how to appropriately use solar resource data in SAM, and hopefully it will be a good review for the rest of you. The most basic fundamentals of solar radiation deal with how the sun moves in the sky with respect to the Earth. We all know that the Earth actually rotates around the sun, but it's helpful in our context to look at the motion of the sun from the reference frame of the Earth, so that's what we do. From our perspective, the sun moves east to west throughout the day, but also rises and falls in the sky. The arc of the sun across the sky changes with the seasons, so in order to completely describe the position of the sun relative to the location on the ground at that moment, we use two angles, the zenith angle and the azimuth angle. The zenith angle indicates how high in the sky the sun is. It's defined as the angle between a vector normal to the Earth's surface at a given location and a vector connecting the Earth and the Sun at that same location, meaning that small zenith angles indicate that the Sun is directly overhead and large zenith angles indicate that the Sun is close to the horizon. The complementary angle to this, which we don't use in SAM but might make more intuitive sense, is the elevation angle which is the angle of the sun above the ground instead of from the normal to the ground. But it's easy enough to translate from one to the other since the sum of the two angles is always 90 degrees. The azimuth angle gives us the other piece of information about the solar position. Most simply, the azimuth angle indicates the location of the sun on a compass. The convention used in SAM is that zero degrees indicates due north <coughs> and it's measured counterclockwise from north. Next, I'll define the solar resource jargon. The most common term you'll hear me use is irradiance. Irradiance refers to the power incident on a surface. It's measured in units of watts per meter squared. Just outside the Earth's atmosphere, the irradiance from the sun is relatively constant, with a generally accepted value around 1366 watts per meter squared. This value does vary a little depending on the season, as the Earth gets closer to and farther from the sun. However, this variation is insignificant compared to the effect of the Earth's atmosphere on the radiation. 
as the solar irradiance passes through the atmosphere, it is frequently absorbed or scattered by molecules in the atmosphere, including ozone and oxygen, or by particulates such as dust and aerosols. And we certainly can't forget about clouds. They have perhaps the greatest effect on the amount of irradiance that finally reaches Earth's surface. So you can see that the interaction of the sun's irradiance with the Earth's atmosphere is fairly complex. As such, we generally break the irradiance that reaches Earth's surface into three components. <coughs> Those three components are shown here. Essentially, two things can happen to a particular photon after it enters Earth's atmosphere if it doesn't get absorbed by the atmosphere. It can either get reflected and scattered by something in its way, or it can pass directly to Earth's surface uninterrupted. These are the basis of the first two types of irradiance. Direct, also called beam irradiance, consists of the photons that make the journey to Earth's surface uninterrupted. To make it more identifiable, this is the type of irradiance that you could reflect with a mirror onto another surface, like a power tower or parabolic trough does, or concentrate with a magnifying glass onto another surface, which is what concentrating photovoltaics do. Direct normal irradiance is the direct beam irradiance measured on a surface that's facing normal to the sun at all times. Because the sun is so far away, the rays of light coming directly from the sun can be considered to reach the Earth in an essentially parallel orientation, and therefore DNI has angles associated with its direction, which are defined by the sun's position in the sky at that time. This allows the surface that faces normal to the sun to be easily defined. DNI is most important for solar installations that track the sun, such as solar concentrating technologies that can only make use of this component of radiation. <coughs> Looking at the photons that are scattered by the atmosphere, they can follow another set of paths, again, if they're not absorbed by something. They may either be reflected back out of the atmosphere, or they may be reflected in such a way that they eventually do arrive at Earth's surface. These photons are referred to as diffuse irradiance. This is the type of irradiance that we get on a very cloudy day. The sky is still bright, but you can't actually see any irradiance coming directly from the sun. Diffuse horizontal irradiance is the energy received on a unit area of a horizontal surface from all directions when radiation is scattered off the atmosphere or surrounding areas. It particularly excludes direct normal irradiance. Lastly, global horizontal irradiance is the total solar energy received on a unit area of horizontal surface. It includes energy from the sun that's received in a direct beam and from all directions of the sky when radiation is scattered. The global component of irradiance is of particular relevance for flat plate photovoltaics which are able to make use of both the diffuse and beam components of solar irradiance. Note that DHI is not just the sum of DNI and DHI, since by convention DNI is defined on a normal surface, whereas DHI and GHI are defined on horizontal surfaces. But they are related by a single equation, shown here, namely that the projection of the direct normal irradiance onto a horizontal surface using the zenith angle of the sun, shown here by z, summed with the diffuse horizontal irradiance are equal to the global horizontal irradiance. So these three irradiance components make up the data that you'd most likely be able to find for your project site to use in modeling. <coughs> now that we've covered the basics of solar resource, I'll discuss two major sources of resource data, measured data and modeled data. As with most things, there are advantages and disadvantages to each of the two options for solar resource data. Measured data has lower uncertainty than modeled data and frequently has higher temporal resolution, which can yield greater accuracy in energy modeling results. It also has the advantage of being site-specific, meaning it can accurately capture the effects of any microclimates that might be happening at the project site, whereas the lower spatial resolution of modeled data means it might miss some local variation. On the other hand, it's difficult to find a long-term measured data set, whereas modeled data sets have a much longer period of record, and I'll discuss the importance of that in a few slides. Measured data is also not as widely available as modeled data, so there might not be a measured data set available near your project site. 
finally, the biggest difference between the two is that measured solar radiance requires proper calibration and regular maintenance of the instruments to ensure an accurate measurement, whereas modeled data is frequently based on satellite or other instruments that are calibrated daily. Ideally, the most accurate solar resource data would combine the advantages of both of these two types of data, which is frequently done in professional resource assessments by correlating on-site measured data to long-term modeled data. Putting aside the advantages and disadvantages of measured versus modeled, I will dig into each type a little bit more. To start with, we'll talk about how to measure solar resource data. There are two basic types of instruments. A pyranometer, shown on the left, is a measurement device designed to measure global solar, which is beam plus diffuse, typically on a horizontal surface. Pyranometers can also be used to measure only diffuse radiation by shading them from the direct beam radiation using a shade ring or a disk. There are two different types of pyranometers, thermopile and photodiode. And I won't get into the particulars of each type here, but thermopile pyranometers are generally regarded to be more accurate than a photodiode pyranometer, but they're also more expensive. <coughs> the measurement uncertainty of a well-maintained pyranometer typically ranges from 3 to 5 percent. A pyroheliometer is a measurement device designed to measure direct beam irradiance only. Pyroheliometers have a fairly small aperture that only sees the sun and a small portion of the sky around the sun and thus need to track the sun as it moves across the sky. Pyroheliometers have a lower typical uncertainty than pyranometers, with well-maintained pyroheliometers having an uncertainty around 2%. But the tracker on which they have to be mounted makes them more expensive and potentially less robust since there are more moving parts. Therefore, many people only opt for a pyroheliometer if they're measuring a site for CFP or CPV since BNI is the only irradiance component that these types of projects can use. The difference between these two types of measurement instrument has important impacts on the types of irradiance data publicly available. Global horizontal data measured by the cheaper and simple, simpler pyranometer is much easier to find than measured direct normal data, and some measurement networks may only provide GHI measurements. <coughs> Modeled irradiance data is a little bit different. In general, there are three steps. First, you compute the total extraterrestrial solar irradiance at a given point in time. Secondly, you apply a clear sky model to the irradiance in order to predict how much of it reaches Earth. Third, you apply a model to predict the effect of clouds on the irradiance. The third step is done in several ways, which are beyond the scope of this presentation, but they may involve either satellite observations or numerical weather models of cloud cover, and subsequently include either an empirical or physical model of the effects that that cloud cover has. Modeled data are calibrated to measure data in various locations. So in those locations, the modeled data may be more accurate than in other locations. Looking at the process of producing each type of solar resource data, it becomes clear that there are a lot of steps in each process that can cause uncertainty in the final values. As I mentioned before, modeled solar resource data, solely by virtue of being a model, have higher uncertainty than a well-maintained measured data set, since modeled data inherently incorporates the uncertainty of whatever measured data it is calibrated to, plus the uncertainty of the model itself. This is an important consideration because solar resource data is frequently the highest source of uncertainty in an energy prediction. So keeping in mind how to choose the resource data, data with the lowest uncertainty can help to increase the confidence in your model results. Discussing uncertainty leads me to choosing the irradiance components that you want SAM to use. On the array page in SAM, shown here, there is the option to choose if SAM should use the beam and diffuse components from the weather file or the total and beam components, also known as global and beam. Eventually, SAM needs the beam and diffuse components to use in the module model, so this option is selected by default. However, if you have a data set where you place much higher confidence in your global data than your diffuse data, or if you don't have diffuse data, 
it might be wise to use the other option in SAM in lieu of the default option and let SAM calculate the diffuse data using the relationship between global, total, and diffuse that I showed before. Before I move on from types of irradiance data sets, there's one other type of irradiance data that you may come across that I haven't addressed yet, which is the plane of array or POA irradiance. This doesn't fall into the category of basic irradiance components because it depends on the project in question. It's not typically available in model data and also not typically available in publicly available measured data, but a specific measured data set might provide it. Plane of array irradiance refers to the irradiance experienced in the plane of the solar object. Whether that's a tracking system, a fixed tilt system at 25 degrees, etc. This concept doesn't particularly apply to CFP or CPV technologies, since those always track the sun and use only the DNI component of irradiance. However, for a PV system, the amount of irradiance that is actually usable by a PV project at a given point in time depends on the position of the sun at that time, the orientation of the array at that time, and a value called the albedo, which describes how reflective the ground is in that area. So you can do one of two things to get the POA irradiance for a project. You can either start with some combination of the three basic irradiance components and then model this irradiance in the plane of array, or you can measure the plane of array irradiance by placing a pyranometer at the same angle as your project instead of horizontally. At first glance, measuring POA might seem like the most logical option for the least weather uncertainty in modeling energy production. Unfortunately, all of the detailed PV module models in SAM require beam and diffuse as separate input components. So if you were to provide SAM with POA, we would have to use an approximation to back out beam and diffuse so that SAM could run the module models. This is the reason that SAM currently does not accept POA as an irradiance input. However, that's not to say that POA measurements are totally useless. Some people performing a measured resource assessment will measure POA irradiance and use it to help calibrate their models and predictions for that project. You could potentially do something like this with SAM by comparing the nominal POA total radiation output from SAM with measured POA and use that to calibrate your inputs to the model, such as albedo. But back to POA irradiance in SAM, we do need the beam and diffuse components properly translated to the array of the project before they're input into the module model. We do this by using one of three irradiance transposition models, the isotropic, the Perez, or the Hay, Davies, Rondel, Kutcher model. The isotropic model is the most simplistic and assumes that the diffuse radiation is uniformly distributed across the sky. This is in general not a great assumption, and the isotropic model is regarded to be the least accurate of these three transposition models. The HTKR and Perez models take into account more complex phenomena occurring with the diffuse irradiance and are generally regarded to be the more accurate models. Regardless of which model is used, the output is beam and diffuse irradiance incident on the plane of array, which SAM can then use in the module model that you've selected. The last important topic I want to touch on before I get into specific types of resource data available in SAM is the importance of long-term historical data. We've discussed measured and modeled data, which both predict the available solar resource at a given point in time. These values may be extremely useful in specific situations, such as system verification tests, where you want to compare the expected system output to the measured system output for a given historical period of time. However, if you want to look at energy production on a predictive basis rather than a backwards-looking basis, how do you know what weather data to use? The biggest driving factor in the difficulty of predicting solar resource data is something we call interannual variability. This refers to the fact that the solar resource varies from year to year. Just like one year you may have a particularly snowy year, and the next year practically no snow at all. The longer the period of time that you measure the solar resource, the more accurately you can hone in on what it's likely to be on average. Say you wanted to predict the solar resource for a location for the year 2014. If you only have resource data for that location for 2013, is that really a good estimate? 
how do you know that 2013 wasn't a fluke year, much higher or lower than average? If you have data from both 2012 and 2013, that gives you slightly higher confidence in your estimate for 2014, and so on. As shown in the figure here for a location in Germany, it took seven to 10 years to really hone in on the 22-year average shown here. This is the importance of having a long-term data set for your energy prediction. Unfortunately, SAM can only model one year at a time, and most financiers are looking for a single annual production number. How do you leverage a long historical data set to get the best estimate if you can only provide a single annual number? Fortunately, there are two relatively straightforward ways to do this. The first is to somehow find the statistical average of the available historical data and use that as your input year, assuming that it will give you a good representation of the average energy production you can expect. The second method is to simulate energy production for every year of historical weather data that you have and look at the distribution of your energy production to give you an idea of the average, worst case, and best case years. Both of these options are possible in SAM. The first method of statistically averaging multiple years of historical data is used very commonly in solar resource modeling whenever someone uses some form of a typical meteorological year, or TMY. The basic idea of a typical meteorological year is that you take a long-term historical data set, usually 30 years or more, and analyze one month at a time for all of the years. For instance, you might look at every January from 1960 through 1990 in order to figure out which one is closest to the average. This is done for all 12 months, and then a full year of hourly values is created using the most typical year for each month. This might result in using January from 1997, but February from 1982 in your particular data set. It's important to note that the TMY algorithm always excludes extreme events, such as natural disasters. An important distinction to make here is that a TMY refers to the algorithm used to create an annual data set. There are also specific TMY products made from a specific data set, most notably the TMY2 and the TMY3, which I will describe later. However, you could apply the TMY algorithm to any data set with a long enough period of record, and you would get a different TMY for each different data set to which you applied the algorithm. The weighting criteria for how the average month is chosen might also vary depending on who implemented the algorithm. You may have noticed in SAM that if you select the download weather file option, you are presented with three typical year options, the TMY, the TGY, and the TDY. The TMY algorithm uses the standard weighting criteria shown here that are used by most people implementing the TMY algorithm with equal weight on global and beam irradiance, as well as some weight on other meteorological characteristics. Some data sources might also offer a TGY, which selects months based only on global irradiance, or a TDY, which selects months based only on the direct or beam irradiance. In general, for most applications, you would choose a TMY, since that's the most standard and accepted typical year, and takes multiple meteorological components into account since multiple components can affect the performance of a PV system. The most notable exception to this is CSP technologies, where you might choose to use a TDY, since T CSP only uses direct irradiance. Other exceptions are more rare. For instance, a mechanically cooled PV system might select the TGY, since temperature and wind speed wouldn't affect an actively cooled system, and PV responds to global irradiance. However, for the most part, if you're not sure about your system, the TMY is probably the best choice for you of the three options. As I mentioned, the second method of leveraging multiple years of historical data is to perform a simulation for each year of data and look at the distribution. In SAM, this is done by performing a P50, P90 analysis. The P50, P90 helps quantify the uncertainty around a predicted energy number. SAM runs multiple years of weather data and computes the P50 value, which is the statistical mean of the distribution of energy production values. To put it another way, 
50% of energy production values in the distribution are below the P50 number, and 50% of values are above the P50 number. Since SAM assumes that the distribution is normal, the P50 value is also the most likely value to occur. In the example distribution shown here, the P50 number is 50 gigawatt hours per year, meaning that in any given year, the currently designed system has a 50% chance of generating more than 50 gigawatt hours and a 50% chance of generating less than 50 gigawatt hours. Since the distribution shown is normal, we can also say that the most likely power production value in any given year is 50 gigawatt hours. The P90 number, also referred to as the 90% confidence interval, is the number which will be exceeded by 90% of all other values. In the example distribution shown here, it is around 46 gigawatt hours. This means that SAM predicts that every year in the distribution has a 90% chance of exceeding 46 gigawatt hours in annual production. This analysis can give you an idea of the average, best case, and worst case scenarios for a system. It will also give you an idea of the sensitivity of your system to weather variability, which can help you to design and plan accordingly. Note that the P50, P90 analysis may also be useful if you can obtain multiple weather file options for the same project site in lieu of several years from one data set. In SAM, P50, P90 analysis can be performed in a few easy steps. First, you click on the Configure Simulations icon, which is represented by the gear and worm and provides access to many of the tools that can be used to perform more advanced analysis in SAM, such as parametric analysis, sensitivity analysis, and P50, P90 analysis. It's located directly next to the green arrow that you use to start a SAM simulation. Second, you would select P50, P90 analysis. Third, you would select multiple weather files from the list of already provided weather files or from weather files that you've downloaded for your location. It's necessary to use enough weather files to calculate realistic P50, P90 values <coughs> and avoid statistical issues associated with small sample sizes. You also need to make sure that you check the Enable P50, P90 Analysis box, since if this box is left unchecked, a P50, P90 analysis will not be run. Finally, you click the green arrow to start the simulation, and SAM runs a simulation for each year or weather file that you specified and then performs a statistical analysis to calculate various P50, P90 values. <coughs> Finally, I'll walk you through the specific types of weather data available in SAM. The first thing to mention is that you can import your own measured weather data in SAM or any other source of weather data for that matter. This option is available on the Location and Resource page. The only trick with doing this is that in order for SAM to read the file, it must be in the same format as one of the other solar resource file types that SAM can read. You can format it yourself and simply direct SAM to the file, or an easier way to do it is to use the Create TMY3 File dialog, which will open the dialog box shown here. The naming of this functionality is a little confusing, since you're not actually creating a TMY3, you're creating a file formatted like a TMY3 file so that SAM can read it. From here, you can open a base TMY3 file to use for formatting, then overwrite the data with your own data for as many of the inputs as you have available. If you do this, you should still select a TMY3 file close to your actual project site, as SAM may still use any of the inputs that you don't provide, so they still need to be representative of your project site. This is a great option if you're using SAM to compare expected system performance to actual system performance for a given period of time, such as in a performance guarantee or a validation study. Another option in SAM is to use one of the TMY files available from the National Solar Radiation Database. TMY2 and TMY3 files are two specific types of typical meteorological year products. The TMY2 files are available for 239 locations and are created from a data set spanning the years 1961 through 1990. The TMY3 files are available for 1,020 locations and represent the years 1991 to 2005. The majority of these locations are models, 
although they do include the measured data sets used to calibrate the model. The TMY3 database is an update of the TMY2 database and includes the 239 TMY2 locations. For those TMY2 locations, the time span in the TMY3 database is 1976 to 2005. The TMY3 data were developed from more recent data and using better modeling techniques than the TMY2 data. However, TMY3 data was developed using a shorter time period than the TMY2 data, so it may be less representative of the resource over the long term. On the other hand, the TMY2 data includes effects from two major volcanic eruptions that reduced the solar resource during the TMY2 time period. So if both TMY2 and TMY3 files are available near your project site, you may want to run SAM with both sets of data to compare results. I would be remiss if I did not mention the intended use of the TMYs. In the TMY3 user's manual, it very clearly states that the TMY data sets provide users with hourly meteorological values that typify conditions at a specific location over a longer period of time, such as 30 years. Their intended use is not necessarily to provide an accurate one-year energy production estimate. They are, as I mentioned before, intended to leverage long-term historical data to provide an idea of average project performance. As you can see from the figure shown here, TMY3s can also vary significantly within a region. This figure shows the annual total GHI from seven TMY3s near Dallas, Texas. The variation between the highest and lowest is upwards of 10%. This is not to say that TMY3s should not be used, but it's an excellent illustration of their intended purpose and limitations. And it's also a good example of why a parametric simulation, or a P50, P90, using multiple available TMY3s might be a useful sensitivity study in the analysis of a system. Another solar resource file option in the U.S. is to download a satellite-derived weather file from a 10-kilometer gridded model data set for the United States, accessed from the Download Weather File option in SAM. This option accesses the NREL Solar Prospector website, a model database across the entire U.S. that contains data for the years 1998 through 2009. When you access this data, you can choose to download a specific year from this data set or you can choose to download a TMY, TDY, or TGY made from this data set. Note that the TMY from the Solar Prospector data set is not the same as the TMY2 or the TMY3, since they are made from different data sets. Rather, it refers to a TMY created from this 12-year model data set using the TMY algorithm. Because SAM is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, there is greater availability of weather data within the U.S. However, if you're modeling a project outside of the U.S., EPW files are the best files for use in SAM in locations where you're not able to provide your own weather file. They can be downloaded from the link at the bottom of the location and resource page and contain a variety of irradiance and meteorological information in the 8760 hourly format that SAM requires. EPW files were collected from a variety of international weather sources by Energy Plus, a DOE-sponsored building energy systems modeling tool. Energy Plus put all of the international weather data into one consistent format that could easily be read by this tool, and we've leveraged that work for SAM by allowing it to read this file format as well. The Energy Plus website has more information on the many sources of this weather data. Now I'll briefly show you how to access all of these different options in SAM. All TMY2 files are included in the SAM download package and can be simply selected from the list on the location and resource page. And the download weather file option allows you to download a solar prospector file. There is also a link at the bottom of the location and resource page that goes directly to the solar prospector website. The create TMY3 file button allows you to access the dialog box where you can input your own data in a TMY3 format readable by SAM. Finally, at the bottom of the location and resource page, there are three links. The first link allows you to download a TMY3 file from the National Solar Radiation Database. 
The second link allows you to download an EPW file whose subsequent steps are shown here. The last link brings you to the NREL Solar Prospector website, the same data accessed by the Download a Weather File option at the top of the page. Finally, I'd like to mention that there are a few other sources for solar resource data in India and Australia in particular as a result of other projects that NREL has completed. More information about where to obtain these weather files can be found in the SAM help documentation in the weather data online section that's linked here. So now that I've run through all the types of weather data available in SAM, how do you ever choose which type of file you should use? Fortunately, the answer to that question is fairly simple. Choose them all. Keep in mind that all of these files represent estimates of the solar resource for a future project. None of them are meant to be used as an exact prediction. So especially if you're interested in the magnitude of the energy production of a system, you will get the best idea of what type of effect variable weather can have on your system and a more accurate range of annual energy production values if you run several weather files for the same project. I've included an idea of the various options that you have here. If the answers you get are fairly consistent, that can give you higher confidence in the number that you're getting for your project. If the answers you get vary pretty widely, it might be a good idea to dig in a little deeper and see if you can find or purchase a better data site specifically for your project site. Running multiple weather files isn't always a necessary step. If you're just interested in a pre-feasibility, ballpark, what order of magnitude will my system get type of answer, one weather file can certainly provide that. But the more weather files you run, the higher confidence you can have in your answer. I will point out that if you're using SAM to compare different project designs, it may not be necessary to run multiple weather files. Any weather file should provide the same answer to the question, which of these two system designs yields higher energy, as long as you aren't interested in the magnitude of that energy production. In that case, it's probably easiest to pick a representative weather file for your location and just be consistent between design iterations. Finally, in the less common case where you are examining a specific historic year of system performance, it is best to choose that year of the historical weather data to run. This option would generally only be used in the case where you are looking at how an existing system performed, such as a system verification test or some type of model validation. So to wrap up, if you are interested in further reading on any of these topics, or for more information that might help you make, find, or choose the best resource data for your project, I'd like to point you to the resources page on the SAM website. We have multiple links for further reading on weather data under the performance models section, including documentation for various types of weather files. You can also find a link to an NREL published report, Concentrating Solar Power Best Practices Handbook for the Collection and Use of Solar Resource Data. Despite the fact that concentrating solar power is in the title, this handbook contains detailed information and best practices for solar resource data collection for other technologies as well. Just be warned that this handbook is not meant to be read from cover to cover, but used as a reference during various stages of a project. And trust me, as someone who has read it cover to cover, it's definitely better not to take that approach. So that's all I have for the webinar today. I'd like to thank you for listening, and don't forget that the video and slides from this webinar will be posted on the SAM Learning page if you want to send them along to someone else who might have missed it today. So at this time, please feel free to type any questions you might have into the chat window, and we'll address them as time allowed. Thanks, Janine. This is Paul Gilman, um, and we do have a, a few questions here. Um, there's one, the first one, um, is about the P50, P90 analysis, and, and um, the question is, is there a way for SAM to give us the standard deviation? And I, I guess I can go ahead and answer that one. I think the, um, for now, uh, SAM does not report a set standard deviation as, uh, among the P50, P90 analysis results. Um, 
So the answer is no. The P90 value compared to the P50 value is based on the standard deviation. So with a little bit of tricky calculation, you could figure out what the standard deviation is if you assume a normal distribution, which we do in SAM. Which we do not. Which we do not. To get the P90. Um, there's, there's a separate uh, webinar on P50, P90 analysis that you could refer to. Um, and uh, I can put a link to it in the um, materials that I post uh, for, for this webinar. Um, the next question um, is, um, I think, Uh, do you have the pros a view on the pros and cons of purchased data set versus the publicly available data set? Um, this is Nate Blair, and uh, NREL doesn't typically take a position on the uh, purchased data sets, but I think that um, you know there are a variety of data sets that are available. I think we particularly run into this question in the international arena where um, the data sets that are publicly available are, are often widespread and um, you know very and don't take into account those locations. European um, government entities often charge for uh, data sets uh, from Europe. Um, and so you would have to look at each of the products and Ideally, we'd be looking for the uncertainty, the number of years that it takes into account, the variables, the, the validation of those data sets, um, and, and really how close it is to the site that you're really considering uh, looking at. Um, we've tried to provide links uh, to as many data sets as possible. Um, and I think, uh, you know, outside of the U.S., it, it becomes uh, more difficult. I will add that um, there is talk that NASA uh, is um, building an international gridded data set that may become available at some point within the next uh, year or so, um, but we don't have any kind of definitive timeline and we're not involved with that process. Thanks, Nate. And by the way, Nate is the, uh, the manager of the, the SAM project, so he's, he's our boss. Um, there's a question here about the Solar Prospector database. Um, uh, several questions here. One is, is it more accurate than TMY2 or TMY3? I think, Janine, you covered that. Um, the other part of the question is, is it available for free? And the answer is yes. The Solar Prospector um, data is um, accessible either directly from SAM um, uh, by clicking the uh, download data button on the on the location and resource page, um, or you can go to the Solar Prospector website itself, where you can click on a map and download the data. I think Janine showed a picture of that map on one of her slides. Um, and if you just Google um, NREL Solar Prospector, you'll get to that website. Um, and again, the data is free. Um, and then do you suggest downloading all years and then take an average? Um, uh, again, I think Janine addressed this. Um, uh, the Solar Prospector uh, website provides the individual year files along with three different forms of typical year data that, that Janine um, described. So I think I would go with the uh, typical year data that's was prepared for the website, although because you, you have the single year data available, um, you're cert it's certainly possible to do some data processing of your own to come up with with uh, whatever average data is you, you, you think is appropriate. Um, let's see, here's one. Um, Janine noted that we can get actual annual year data from Solar Prospector from a 10 kilometer square on the map. 
Um, she noted that each of these data sets are modeled. Are there any actual annual data sets available that are not modeled? Any uh, measured specific year data sets? Um, Janine, do you want to take that one? They're not available through the prospector. Um, there are a few measurement networks that you might be able to access several years of measured data through, such as the ISIS or SURFRAD networks. Um, however, the measured data locations are not particularly widespread throughout the country, so you would have to be examining a project near one of those existing measurement sites. The NREL provides something called the MIDC. Um, uh, and did you cover that? And that's access to a variety of actual measurement sites. Um, it's uh, if you just search on NREL and MIDC, you should be able to come across that. That has a, a I would say about 20 different sites um, with real-time weather data uh, being provided. Um, so. Uh, that's one source, uh, and I think on there they have some uh, links to other uh, measurement networks. And there's a variety of public available data versus um, data that's not publicly available from those. Um, people who do the modeling uh, usually take that measured data and compare it to the model data to try and improve the, the modeled output. Okay. Um. The next question is, can I generate random solar resource values within SAM with a certain variation to evaluate the impact of the uncertainty on energy output? Uh, no, that is not currently an option in SAM. Uh, you might be getting that from one of the options in modeling SAM wind, which is to create a distribution with Weibull characteristics, but that's not something that translates over to solar. Um, and then an another question is, considering that the TMY3 data sets are still using the previous versions of the Perez satellite algorithms, um, is there a plan to update these to create a TMY4 data set? Um, with the prospector update, there can be big delta between the two data sources for some locations. So updating with the newest satellite algorithms in, uh, in a TMY4 data set um, may reduce this gap. Uh, um, there are a variety of processes uh, that, that we know of just tangentially uh, on the SAM team to uh, update and improve satellite models, um, but uh, uh, I don't know of anything to create a TMY4 data set at this point for those locations. Um. Next question, anyone working on irradiance projections based on climate change? Uh, it's a good question, and I will say that this is Nate Blair again, and we have actually proposed a uh, internal lab-funded research project to try to incorporate uh, data from large climate models into a TMY type file. Um, and we do not know the funding status of that yet, but, but um, but that's one possibility. I think no matter what we were to do on that front, um, you know, all of that data would be highly uncertain. But it, but your question, uh, just because the climate models themselves are have a higher level of uncertainty, obviously, than historical data. Uh, but it does point to the question that we are proposing systems that will last for 20 to 30 years based entirely on historical weather patterns. So. Um, so that is an issue that we have also identified and, and are working to get funding to look at further. Okay. And the next question, um, is the data necessarily um, hourly based? Um, I guess I can take that one. SAM is, um, SAM's photovoltaic models in particular are hourly simulation models um, in the current version. Um, that we do, we are working on on um, making the simulation uh, uh, time step variable so that you can choose a different time step. Um, but of course, that means that 
if you're going to run at a smaller time step, say 10 minutes instead of 60 minutes, then you need 10 minute weather data. And all of the weather data sets that we've been discussing um, today are our hourly data sets. Um, so you would, uh, you would need um, access to higher resolution data set. Um, I don't know, Janine or Nate, if you want to follow up on that. Uh, I don't think so. Um, is the solar prospector data the same as the 2009 SUNY 10 kilometer gridded data? And is there a way to programmatically download the solar prospector based TMY data set? Um, the answer to the first part of that question is yes, it is the same. Um, the answer to the second part is no. Um, due to our licensing agreements with Clean Power Research uh, and the Solar Anywhere people, we uh, we don't offer the ability to download that data programmatically. You you can buy the Solar Anywhere product, obviously, from Clean Power Research uh, at various levels of resolution and aggregation. Um, I wanted to make uh, w uh, one point to add to what uh, Janine mentioned about um, uh, using about POA irradiance. Um, she mentioned that the flat plate photovoltaic models in SAM cannot take uh, POA irradiance as an input. Um, I did want to point out that the, the PV watt model in SAM does allow POA irradiance um, as an input. Um, so the, that is, it is possible if you have that data to use it with the uh, PV watts model. And I just, I'm showing the page here with the option on the PV watts solar array page. Um, and then there are a couple, a couple of questions about where to find the recordings for um, this, uh, for today's session. Um, and that's going to be on the learning page on the SAM website. Uh, we've got the upcoming webinar schedules at the top. Um, so you, uh, I assume everyone saw this when they registered. Uh, the recordings for past webinars are down at the bottom. Um, so we'll, we'll add um, today's webinar um, to this list, um, either later this afternoon or, or, or tomorrow morning. And then there's other learning resources here on this page. Another question here, does NREL have a plan to generate its own satellite data, not relying on CPR? Um, that's a good question for the NREL solar resource team. Um, and I think they're working on coming out with a long-term plan uh, for future uh, solar resource data. Okay, um, another question here is, do you have suggestions for converting G GHI to DHI and DNI values? I have been using the disk model you recommended that come from a spreadsheet, but is, um, is there any estimate of uncertainty with that? Um, I don't know, Janine, are you familiar with the disk model? I am familiar with the disk model. I can't say off the top of my head if there are any uncertainty estimates for it. Um, I would imagine that any uncertainty estimates would be in the documentation for that model itself. Um, that would be a good question to post on the support forum. Um, if, if you want a link to the documentation, I can provide it there. Okay, are there any other questions? We do have another five minutes. Okay, Nate or Janine, did you want to make any other comments? Um, I don't know that Janine spoke about it, but in the next version of SAM, we will be providing our new um, solar weather file format. Did you talk about that? I did not mention that. So um, one of the things that we're developing um, right now this year is a 
uh, it, it file format that's more flexible, um, uh, somewhat specific to SAM at this point, but if other people want to use it, that would be great with us. Um, that allows for sub-hourly uh, weather data and also um, its reduced size will allow us to uh, ship SAM with a broader weather data set, uh, specifically including the TMY3 files uh, in addition to TMY2 files. So those will pop up automatically in your weather file box uh, in SAM, and we see that as a, a, a step forward and an improved ability to, to share weather files uh, more broadly. Um, we're also working to improve the P50, P90 weather data sets. Um, some of the historical years had some data missing, which particularly for CSP systems caused uh, problems, and we hope to have that uh, file, uh, that set of historical data uh, improved in the near future. Okay, and there's a question here, uh, uh, it's more about modeling PV systems. Um, any recommendations as to project size needing SAM analysis versus PV watts, any residential or mostly large commercial? Um, I'll take that quickly. There's, there's no limit to the size of system that you can model using the flat plate PV or PV watt models. Um, so the choice of uh, between those two models wouldn't be the size of the system. It would be more the level of detail of, of modeling that, that you want to do. Um, and that's all I'll say on that topic here. Um, does the P50, P90 analysis option use the 2009 SUNY data? Uh, no. No, we don't use the 10K gridded data for the P50, P90 analysis, and we only have that for the certain locations. Right. You could do, you could download all, what is it, 13, 13 years um, of data and, and do a P50, P90 analysis. Uh, in general, we recommend using a 20-year or larger data set for P50, P90. Obviously, the more years you have, the more uh, appropriate the P90 number is, um, and so you have a higher uncertainty with fewer years of data. But you can do that with by going to the solar prospector and downloading each of the individual years and then doing um, that analysis in SAM. Right. So it's possible it's possible to do a P50 P90 analysis on your own if you on a collection of annual weather files. Um, um, and I'm sort of showing where you do that here in the in the user interface. Um, but again, I'll I'll try to post links to more information about P50 P90 on the uh, on the page where I, I post the materials for this website. Um, so I think we're out of time. Um, thanks, Janine, for a great presentation, and thanks everyone for their participation. Um, and uh, I'll I'll go ahead and and sign off. Okay, thank you.